Well, good morning one more time. Well, we've got a few more folks. I'm sorry, I interrupted your good morning, didn't I? Good morning. Good morning. Okay, we're past that awkwardness. Uh, Brother Nate says, uh, good morning from a deer stand. Uh, so, Brother Nate's going to be out the next few weeks. I kind of, I didn't mention that last week because I didn't want some of you not to come this week if you knew I was preaching. So, uh, but he does say good morning and he is thinking about you. So, guys, join me in prayer as we pray for, not right now, but in during the week, we pray for Brother Nate that he gets a rejuvenation, that he gets a break, that he clears his head, he comes back and he's on fire and he gets to preaching up here and he goes 10 times faster than he normally goes and makes up 10 more words than he normally does and we put that in our book of Nathisms, right? And so just be praying for that though, that he gets excited and a big book. <laughs> yeah, I noticed his neck was swelling a little bit and so I knew it was about time for him to get out of here. So, so we'll pray for a big buck as well. So anyways, um, Alan, where you, where'd you go? Did you leave? I think he left, went out for a second. Well, just thank you guys, praise team, for leading us in worship. That's some good worship. It makes me want to preach for hours. So if you get mad at me today, blame the praise team, all right? But I've been come to known as the prop guy. So the young adults were at my house last night, and we had about 15, I guess. I don't know, it was coming and going. But they come over to the house, and they brought some new faces and some new young adults, age 18 to 25. You guys can, get, if you're that age and you want to come hang out with us, you're more than welcome. But they got to talking, and they brought new faces, and then they got to talking about me. And it's like, oh, yeah, you need to come to church tomorrow. Like, Mike's going to be, he's, it's going to slap. He's going to, like, be bringing it. And he, they're saying all their words. And I was just kind of like, I have no idea what you just said. Was that an insult? But they were just inviting them and stuff. And they got to talking about some of my old sermons. It's like, these guys, let me go ahead and tell you all something. They are listening. They got to talking about my dog named Butch. They got talking about Southtown Simple. They got talking about Baskets. They got talking about greatness. They got talking about the time me and Alan walked to Emmaus. I mean, they were just like, just hitting me with everything. And it was kind of like, oh man, it was humbling. Like people listen when I get up here, when I speak, not to say you don't with brother Nate, but for me in general, I was listening, but I was being come to known as a prop guy. And I had a whole prop situation set up here. I set it up Wednesday and, and, and I prayed about it and I was going through the week preparing for today. And I was kind of like, yeah, that's not going to work. So I got rid of those props. But I have another prop. And this prop actually, God inspired the word that's on my heart today. But he used how I got this. Some of you just leaned up in your chair. I'm not sharing this with you. By the way, the original one that inspired this, it's gone. He didn't make it out the hallway. Alan, I just saw something, though. I got a way to get them to put their hands in the air and worship now. It's like, who wants the Snickers? Apparently nobody. Okay, that tried. You want it? <laughs> so there's a way we could get them. But the Snickers. I was looking at this, and I was thinking about it, and, and, and I was getting it out of a vending machine. And I'll tell the story here in a minute. But I just wanted to start with, this Snickers gave me a Tina Meadows moment of faith. She's like, where is this going? Let me tell you where this is going. If, you, if, you, if you're new to our church and if you wasn't on that mission trip, well, we went on a mission trip to Midland, Arkansas. I hadn't been at the church very long. And uh, this church got the funds and, and started this massive project to build a brand new fellowship hall. And I don't remember exactly what happened, whether it's a, a, a breakup of the church or pastor left or there was something that happened where this church did not have the manpower uh, to finish this project. So we joined with Baptist builders and we joined with other groups. But uh, Nath got a team together and we went to this church to help them out. Well, we show up at the church and we get there and they've got the building up. And they've got the, the two before walls run everywhere. And so we were immediately put on the sheetrock crew. And I hadn't been at the church very long and... So Nate started putting groups together, and apparently because I'm a good-looking guy, Brother Nate put me on the crew that was hanging the sheetrock on the roof. I was like, okay. So three-quarter rock, if you've ever hung three-quarter rock, and you're trying to slam that up on a ceiling, it ain't fun. And so because I was a good-looking guy, I was put on that crew. Because the, the crew that was with me, it was me, Brad Burks, Mark Schutzius, and Mike Nix. We're all good-looking guys. 
So that's the only reason. It wasn't that we were young and everybody else was old. So we get up there and we're, we're hammering out these walls and we're having a good time. At least I was. I don't know if they were or not. Um, I'm, I'm from the construction background, so I was constantly making construction jokes. So I apologize for that if it offends anybody. But I was having a good time. And we was hanging this sheetrock and we was going through there. We got done hanging the rock. Then here we come. We, we laid the mud. We put the mud on there. Then after the mud, it's like these guys are so amazing. Then they're like, well, can you sand that down? So we started sanding it down. And we started to get it ready for the painters. And um, that went down. It was a great trip. I got really close to folks. I got to share my testimony for the first time. It was just really good for me. And so fast forward. So Brother Nate tells us, as always, when you go on a mission trip, I want somebody to get up and speak about the trip. And so I was like, well, I'll do it, you know, because I'm trying to put my face out there. So I was thinking about it and I got up here and I was like, yeah, because I'm a good looking guy, they used me to hang the sheetrock on the ceiling. It was fun. It was it was a good time. And I go and sit down. And Tina Meadows gets up here. So Tina gets to talking. And she's like, yeah. She said, we we had a good time. That was my Tina Meadows voice. We had a good time. <laughs> and uh, we... We got up there. It was great fellowship. And she says, we got to, I got to do some mudding. Mr. Harold McDonald, man, he was slapping some mud. I'll never forget that man up on, st- on the little stilt thing he built. And he's just up there. I mean, 70, 80. I don't know. He might have been 30 then. I don't know. But she was just, just rolling out. I was like, look at that guy. It's like, I hope I don't have to do that. Hurry up, Harold. Uh, but anyway, so Tina got to talking about it. And she was talking about laying the mud. And then she got to talking about the sanding. And here it come, right? She said, I got to thinking. She says, oh, I, I get to thinking as I was sanding that wall. That's what God does to us. He just sands us and starts to remove the blemishes and starts to make us perfect in the eyes of God. I'm like, dang. I get up here and say, oh, she rock had fun. Great deal. She gets up here and she does this spiritual moment. It's like, I'm glad I don't have to follow that. But it was like, I got to thinking about it, and I was like, man, I got my moment. I got my, my Tina Meadows moment of faith, and it was a snicker bar, and it was a vending machine. But my story goes like this. Uh, I went to visit some people at Mount, uh, not, this is Mount Vernon, at Forkham Lanham, where I used to work. And I went to visit them just to, just to see how they're doing and catch up with them. And I got hungry, and I wasn't myself. And so I went over to the vending machine, right? I went up to the vending machine and I scanned it. I stood there and I looked at it and I looked from the left to the right, from the top to the bottom. And, and there it was in all of its glory at B4. I just looked at it and it was kind of like the little red rider BB gun in the Christmas story. He's, it's just everything glows around that snicker bar. And I'm just sitting there staring at it and I was like gotta have it not only do i gotta have it i want it and so i looked at the bar and i was sitting there and i was like all right let's do this and then the problem started right has anyone bought a snicker bar in a bidding machine in a while it ain't 75 cent no more i'm standing there in the front of the bidding machine it says dollar 75 and i'm like but i gotta have it I'm hungry. I got to have it. So I I reached in my pockets and apparently I thought Jesus was going to move in my pockets, but he didn't. Thought he was going to make the 5,000, you know, feed the 5,000, but he didn't. So anyway, so I I reached around in there and I didn't have the quarter. So I I walked over to, apparently I do have friends, whether you believe it or not. And so I walked up to somebody and said, hey man, I'm hungry. (laughs) You got some change. You can spot me. And so they gave me some change and I walked back over to the vending machine and I said and I raced probably I ran back to it like you still there okay you're still there and I got out the quarters and I put them in there B well it wasn't like that it was B4 over here B4 I got so excited I was just like I got to watching it and let's let's be honest what I did right I bent over like with the little thing and I was going to put my hands in there Because I didn't want this thing. Okay, let's be honest, truly. I got on my knees. And I was watching this little thing spin. And I was like, oh, here he comes. Come on. 
And it got to rolling, rolling. I was like, yes, sir, come on. And then you know what happened, right? It stopped. I looked at it and I was like, well, I got up off my knees. I was like, wait a minute, what are you, what are you doing? <laughs> I gently tapped on the glass. I've done what I'm supposed to do. I gave you my dollar seventy five. I got down on my knees. I've done everything I'm supposed to do. Give me my Snickers bar. It didn't happen. So then I gently shook it. You laugh because you don't gently do it, do you? And guess what? It still didn't move. I went and told somebody, you know, they didn't care. It wasn't their dollar seventy five, and now I owe somebody seventy five. They didn't care, but I stood there and I looked at it for a minute. And this is no lie. I stood. I looked right at that vending machine, and I got to thinking about it. that's what I do to Jesus. We come into this church, we show up inside this church, we give offerings, we pray, we worship, we do, and then we do a little bit more, then we do a little bit more, and we walk up to Jesus like he's this vending machine. I've done what I've done, now give me what I want. Give me what, you, what I think I need. Jesus, I need you to do for me what I need you to do for me. And when he doesn't do it, we get mad, we get angry, we get frustrated, we complain, we lash out at people around us who don't deserve it in the first place. And all that happened is because we pressed before. Now give me what I want. Give me what I need. And we treat Jesus like this personal vending machine. Someone who's there to always answer our prayers how we see fit. How it can benefit us. How it can work in our life. Like we, I know some of you are looking at your toes right now. I looked at my own toes when I started this message. We treat Jesus like we're the boss. Like we know what we really need in this life. And that he only needs to respond to our demands and how we see that working out. And when he does not deliver, we gently shake things. We gently get angry. We wonder about his goodness. We blame him that our life is not pictures as it should be. Kind of like how we act when a Snickers gets stuck in a vending machine. So the opening not question today is, I'm not asking you, I'm telling you today. Jesus is not a vending machine. My view of Jesus has uh, become construed sometimes. Church, we, we come in here uh, week after week. And what I want to do, my goal, my plan today, through the Word of God, through this time together, is that we readjust our views. We readjust our views. Uh, this morning, we're going to open the Word of God, and we're going to be looking at an event that, record, that was recorded in the first three Gospels. It's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And we're going to look at this event and we're going to start to study about a man that comes before Jesus Christ and he's saying, good rabbi, what must I do to have eternal life? He comes before Jesus with a, the right question, the right outward expressions, but something's off inside. His view is off inside. And so we're going to look at this. And if you could take the, uh, the first three chapters or the first three Gospels, if you take all the accounts of what's going on there, we find out the young man is rich, he's young, and he's a ruler. And some of the scholars actually say that he was a ruler of a local synagogue, a local place of worship. So that's the man. And so if you got your Bibles, and I pray that you do, and you can go to the cell phone if you want to, but you can't replace a good paper Bible. So if you have your Bibles, be turning with me to Luke 18, and I'm going to read verses 18 through 23. And we're going to go to work there. So Luke 18, 18, it says, And a ruler said to him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. 
You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witnesses. Honor your father, your father and your mother. And he said, all these I have kept from my youth. And when Jesus heard this, he said to him, the one thing you still lack, sell all that you have and distribute it to the poor and you will have treasures in heaven and come follow me. But verse 23, when he had heard these things, he became very sad for he was extremely rich in Jesus and he became extremely rich. Pray with me. Father God, I come to you right now. This this set of scriptures, right, God, that, that we, we, we open up and we read about a man that comes up and says, Lord, what must I do to have eternal life? Father, it's a great question. It's on the question of so many people in the world today. Now, my prayer, God, as we go through the rest of this message, that our views become aligned with you. God, that we see you for who you are. God, we see our sin for what our sin is. God, that we see our view of salvation is as it should be. It's in the blood of Christ. And God, I pray that through this word today, God, that someone will come to know you as Lord. Father, I pray that through this word today, God, that, that someone that has already accepted you as Lord, but their views have been misaligned, God, that through the reading of God's word today, through the meditation, through the fellowship, through everything we do here today, God, I pray, Father, as it was a pray, prayed earlier, that we just don't be hearers of the word, but we be doers of the word, that we take what we hear today, God, and we apply it to our lives. God, please convict us. God, please challenge us, God, so that we can live changed lives. So, Father, I give you this message. I give you this time. Father, let me preach with sincerity. God, let me preach with urgency. And God, let me preach with authenticity. Father, I just want to honor and glorify you. It's in Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. So how did he get here? How did he get to this question where at the beginning of it, he's saying, what must I do, good rabbi? What must I do to have eternal life? To the point where he walks away saddened, walks away broken. How did he get there? Here we go. His views are off. The first view is, is his view of Christ. His view of Christ. How he sees Christ as he walks up. Matthew and Mark actually records it that he comes up and he bows on the knee. He gets on his knees and comes before the Lord. So he walks up to Christ, but his view is off. Luke 18 says, and a ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to have eternal life? It's a great question. In fact, we should actually uh, commend this young man for coming to Christ in a public statement, a public moment, and asking about matters of uh, eternity. I mean, I would love it if people would come up to me wherever I'm at, whenever I'm at, and talk about and have questions of eternal life with me. I was at a birthday party about a month ago, and, and... and I was just there to eat birthday cake and, and throw cornhole. But the next thing I know, we're having a, a one hour church service with a bunch of lost people around a, a fire. And it's like they come talking to me and asking me questions and stuff. So I look for those moments because my view of Christ is not the same as it is of this young man. Because this question, when he asks it, uh, he's, he's, he's asking from a place that Jesus already knows why he's asking. He's asking from his heart. And if you've ever heard a few of my last sermons, you should know that Jesus knows you. He knows your heart. Sorry. He knows your identity. He knows what you're doing. You're not fooling God. So, so Jesus is about to answer this man's question. What must I have to do? He's going to ask it because of he knows what his heart is. And Jesus said to him, verse 19, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Jesus does not come out the gate saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Would have answered it, would have solved up, would have taken a lot of scripture out of the Bible if Jesus would have come straight out of there. How do I have eternal life? Well, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. He could have went straight there. He could have went right to that point. But he responds with, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Many of us would read past that and not think to look into it and say, well, is Jesus saying he's not God? 
That's not what Christ is saying. The term good during this time was never used to describe rabbis and teachers during this time. So the, y'all don't understand something. Even the name of God, Jehovah God, was so reverent, reverent, was so honorable that sometimes some people wouldn't even speak the name of God. But not just that, they would all take the word good that we say, and they wouldn't even use it to describe a taco. <laughs> they wouldn't use it to describe anything. It was only meant to be used to describe God. So res- by responding, Jesus saying, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. He's making sure, and he's making sure you today, for those of you that call Jesus Lord, He's making sure that you know what you're saying. He's making sure that you are willing to accept what he's about to say to you. So when you come to Christ and you, you ask questions and you maybe in eternal life, but if you call him good father, good Lord, if you sing praise and honor to him and you say all that about him, you need to know that he knows why you're coming. Now, the thing is, do you really know who he is? Do you really view him for who he is? Because... He is saying, are you willing to accept what I'm about to say to you? Are you willing? Are you okay with what I'm about to give you? Because if you really knew that Jesus is God, we'll see here in a second. Why in the world would you argue about the law? If you really knew that Jesus was God here in a minute, you're going to see why in the world would you ever brag about your character? If you really knew Jesus was God, here we go, look at your toes. Why would you refuse to obey the word of God? If you really call him Lord. You call me good. Let's see. Because they're in the church who argue about the law. The church has gotten to a point where it's allowing our feelings to dictate the truth. Does the church do this? Yes. It's easier, uh, easier way to make it. Uh, we'll, we'll go south town simple. The church says, well, on the on the top. Well, I feel on the topic of homosexuality, sexual identity. I feel that we should dot, dot, dot. Right. Or should the church say on the topic of homosexuality, on the topic of gender identity, the Bible says. So we argue about the law. Do we brag about our character? I can't tell you how many conversations that I've had with people that has ended with this. The church is nothing but judgmental hypocrites. Many people are not in a church today because of, guess what? The church. Because we put on this fake mask and we do all this stuff and we put on this thing and and I, I listen. I am teaching the youth here that it's okay to be not okay. It's okay to to struggle because here's what we were designed for. Here's what we was made for to come along together as a family and go through life together. I'm not up here just saying a political speech or, or some fancy saying. I am literally trying to do everything I can to say it's okay that you're struggling. Not in the sense of it's okay. That I don't want you to hurt, but I want you to know that it's okay to come around me and say, Mr. Mike, I, I'm dealing with anxiety. I'm dealing with depression. I'm dealing with suicide. I've walked so many students off of that ledge at 3 o'clock in the morning. I've had so many conversations where kids have come up and they're like, I'm struggling. I'm like, amen, so am I. Let's pray together. Let's talk together. Let's go through this. Let's do this. But for some reason, when we come into the church, we want to build up our walls And act like we're okay. We're showing whatever. And then on the disobeying the word of God. Do I even really need to say that? We won't acknowledge it as obedience. We water the word of God down. We we manipulate it. We take the word of God out of context. So that here's the key thing. Ready? I want that to fit my narrative. I want that to fit what I'm going through. I want that to fit my want, my needs. Thou shalt not steal. Well, it's only a pen. Thou shalt not covet. But God, you know this is not something I want. This is actually something I I, I need this. We disobey the word of God. 
And it was so funny. I was studying on this and preparing this message this week, and I got to thinking, whew, the church is looking a lot like the rich young ruler right now. I feel like the church is walking up to Jesus and we're saying, be for. And before we can even attempt to correct that, right, to correct those views, we've got to discuss. And before we can discuss the eternal matters, we need uh, as a body, you and I, we need to acknowledge that we understand Jesus Christ is God. That he is Lord That he is a good God. Does that not stir something up inside any of you when you hear that? Can you literally say right now that he is a good God without something in your stomach stirring? When you hear he is a good God, why is it that we can't shout amen to that, but we can shout when the Cowboys score a touchdown? How is it that you can sit here and sing praises in the morning and you can, and then, well, some of you sing praise. You get, I'm not saying we got a yeehaw, let's go, let's rock and roll. But I'm just saying, when you hear that Jesus Christ is God, he is Lord, he is good, and he is a big God, does not something stir inside of you? It should. I got bumps on my arms right now. There should be something about you because I believe, though, your view of God has been misstrued. You've, you've lost it. He's just somebody now that you come in here on Sunday morning and you, you listen to a guy talk about a Snickers and you sing praise with Alan and the team and you put money in the offering. and He's just something you do now, but he's not actually. We need to get back to how we view God. He deserves that. He is Lord. Amen. He is a good God. Amen. He is a big God. Amen. Ah, I'll work on you. We've got to get back, church. We look nothing. We do not look different from the world because of how we just responded. We should be singing praises to the Father. Not just in here on Sundays and Wednesdays, but out in the workforce, out in Walmart, out wherever a lost soul may be. There should be something different about you. It's because you don't view Jesus as a vending machine. No, no. Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is a good God. Jesus Christ is my God and he's a big God. They should see that in your actions. They should hear that in your voice. So maybe our views are off on him. Maybe we're saying, good God, what must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus is like, are you ready for this? Do you view me as God? Do you say, this is a long one, long point, I get it. Do you say that you believe that Jesus is Lord and go on about your lives, ready, forgetting about him? And only come to him when, here we go, you want or you need something. If that's you, your view is off. The second view, let's go ahead and move on here. The second view is that his view of sin is off. His view of sin is off. Jesus continues on with verse 20. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And he said, all of these I have kept since youth. Once again, Jesus has a golden opportunity to come running in. We still haven't answered the question of how do I have eternal life? He could come running in one more time. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the father except through me. Jesus now takes the rich young ruler To the law of Moses. It's interesting to note that of those commandments, murder, steal, bear fault witnesses, those commandments of the law. It's it's interesting to note that those are all external things. I know that Christ later in Matthew and Mark and and they say, you know, if you have lust in your eyes and your heart, you commit uh, adultery. I know he says if you allow anger to go down uh, over someone, go down in the night or whatever, you've committed murder. I understand that. But in the general context right here, these are all Outward, external actions, things you can do. 
things that can be seen. It's also worth noting that since I just finished my Romans class, uh, the discussion of eternal matters is that the law of, uh, law of Moses and obedience to the law, ready, here we go, does not save you. It does not save you. How do I inherit eternal life? Well, the law, you know the commandments. Do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witnesses. Well, the law doesn't save you. Why does he answer with that? Well, here we go. Galatians 2. And to add that about the save us, I got to throw this one in there. Galatians 2.16 says, Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified, justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. The law serves, church, as a mirror to show how dirty you are. But the, law, the mirror cannot wash you. See, the law... The Ten Commandments can bring the sinner to Christ. But the law cannot make the sinner like Christ. See, the young ruler, when he looked at that, he did not look into a mirror and see himself as a condemned sinner before a holy God. No, no. He had this shallow view of the law of God. He had this shallow view of his sin. Because here's what he was doing. And this may be somebody in the church today. You're measuring your obedience to God by external actions and not inward attitudes. You may be right now today measuring your obedience to God by the things you can do, the external actions, but your heart is off. Your inward attitude is not where it should be. You're just doing this. To, you're just here today because it's a checklist. I'm here today because I want to give God everything I've got. I'm here today because I want to sing praise and I want to I want the people around me to feel how much I love Jesus and how much God can move in everybody's heart. And I'll do that through my external actions, but my measurement of obedience is not on what I do. It's about what's going on in here. This man, this rich young ruler, he had a misaligned view of sin. And I'll tell you why. The church has the same thing. In today's society, sin is debated. Have you ever thought about that? Sin is debated. The world says that sin is not always accepted as sinful. Some believe that they should be free to live and to do however they want without anyone telling them what they should do. They only have one rule. Don't harm each other. Sounds honest, sounds okay, but what's the problem with that? How you view harm and how I view harm are two different things. Some of you may have wanted a Snickers today, but you may be a don't lay a finger on my Butterfinger guy. I should be getting paid for all this endorsement. Our opinions are different. Our opinions are not the same. My favorite color is blue. Alan, what's yours? Dang. He was trying to help me with my point there. Our opinion, that's because we're brothers. Um, but a lot of times our opinions don't line up. What offends you doesn't offend me. What offends me doesn't offend you. So if you're sitting there saying, well, just do whatever you want, as long as it makes you feel good, as long as you don't hurt someone. The problem is if you turn on the TV, a lot of people have feelings and a lot of people have opinions and a lot of people have differences. So you cannot say that, that, that sin is, is not a, a sinful um, another debate that's going on is that sin varies in severity. I've taken a lot of classes, and this is where you're going to learn more about situational ethics and moral relative, relativism, where that comes from. It's based on the belief that right and wrong are not absolute. They're variables. Based on situation, based on the person, based on the circumstances. And, and the, the, sl the scale is, is always moving and sliding and adjusting. And that no sin is over this sin. But we need to listen to James 2, 8, 11. I won't try and argue that point. I'll just let the word of God do that. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin. And are convicted by the law as transgressors. Verse 10, here it is. James 2, 10. 
For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point, in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he, for he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. But if you commit adultery, but you do not murder, you still have become a transgressor of the law. So the only way to really look at our sin is through a biblical view. And what does the biblical say? Well, we'll go back to that 2.10. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one has become guilty of all of it. Church, you have committed sin. You are a sinner. Sorry if that's bad news to you today. But I have some good news here in a little bit. Stay with me. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Southtown Simple Version, y'all are all sinners. For all have sinned. All means all. Romans 5.8 says, But God shows His love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You, the sinner, Christ died for. Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin, because we're all sinners, is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I'll talk more about that in a minute. So it's only when we look at the view of sin and we understand it, it's only when we understand God's wrath towards sin can we begin to realize that we need to be saved from it. Why do I get emotional? Why do I cry? Because I truly understand grace. I truly understand the sinful man that I was. And I wasn't a bad man. But I was not a good man. I was a sinner. And I know what Jesus Christ and what ditch he dug me out of. And I know where he sets me now. And he stands me in front of amazing people every week and says good morning to because I love every one of you. And so my passion comes from my view of how I viewed my sin. I deserved death. I did not deserve what he's given me. And it's, it's when we understand that God's wrath towards sins, we can start to realize why we need to be saved from it. It's only when we hear the bad news, right? That we deserve judgment, that we can begin to appreciate, begin to celebrate, begin to honor the good news that God, through his son, Jesus Christ, provided salvation and forgiveness for all of our sins. It's only through our sins can we truly, truly be amazed at this word called grace. It's not the grace that died 30 years ago. It's the grace of Jesus Christ looking past your sins, looking past your struggles, looking and seeing the heart of a man that loves him and saying, I died for him. That's grace. But it's only our view of sin that will get us to that grace. Because if we walk up to the vending machine of Jesus and think we're going to turn around and just put in that dollar seventy five or the commandment keepings as the young man is doing right here. He's thinking he's going to get eternal security, eternal salvation by what he does, his ten commandments of keeping. Your view is off. It's about nothing about what you do. It's always about what he's done. And the final view, I'm going to move on here. His final view is his view of salvation is off. His view of salvation is off. Luke 18, verse 22, we continue. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, One thing you still lack, sell all that you have and distribute it to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when he had heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. Matthew nineteen twenty two says, When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Mark ten twenty two says, Disheartened by the sayings, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Same, same opening question. Same end result. I think it's ironic that the rich young ruler who believed that eternal life comes from doing could not do. The young man that wanted the answer to the eternal life, the man that had sat there and said, I have not murdered, I have not coveted, I have honored my mother and father, I have, I have done all of these things. The man who could do, now he can't. He refused to obey God. 
Jesus was his vending machine. He wanted salvation on his terms and not God. Like we often do, the rich ruler wanted Jesus on our terms. But there's a difference, I think, sometimes, is we want Jesus on our terms and our schedules. Jesus should have priority in everything you do in life, church. It comes before the basketball. It comes before the baseball. It comes before the work. It comes before the house chores. It comes before the to-do list. It comes before your wife. It comes before your husband. It comes before your kids. Jesus should be everything. Your ministry, your life should be wrapped up in Christ. You can't have Jesus on your terms. It just doesn't work. We want to gain Jesus' life while sacrificing nothing of our own. We want to live in this world where we can have just as much of the Snickers as we want, right? I may even throw a Butterfinger in there after this. The problem is, Do not love the world or the things in this world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eye and the pride of life is not from the Father, but from the world. And the world is passing away along with those desires. But whoever does the will of God, not the will of self, abides forever. We want to gain Jesus' life while sacrificing nothing of our own. Another problem with that is 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 we must be willing to lose everything for the sake of the gospel. Many have been raised in the church. No Luke 9, 23. But if you ever, 23 and 24. But if you ever looked at the order of 23 and 24, it says, And he said to all, If any would would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Many in the church today can say, I am doing that. I am following Jesus. But are you doing it in the order that Scripture lays it out? Have you denied yourself? Do you pick up your cross daily, not just on Sundays? You have to do those things first. Deny yourself. Pick up your cross daily. Come follow me. We want Jesus' life without sacrificing, while sacrificing nothing of our own. This is not a suggestion. This is a mandate. We do not get to define the terms of our discipleship and our growth in Christ. Jesus does. We do not get to negotiate with Jesus under what conditions you will follow him. Jesus has made those conditions clear. Crystal. I either follow Jesus Christ on his terms or I do not follow him at all. He is not a vending machine for my convenience. He is actually the sovereign savior who demands my obedience. For here it's not even his good, my good. And if we can ever get our line of who Jesus is and and how we view our sin and how we view salvation, then that can lead us over into the promise that he ends this study with Peter with, who says, who remember, Peter is the man who left his home to follow Jesus. But this promise that Jesus is going to make in Luke twenty eight uh, twenty I mean Luke eighteen twenty nine this is to every person in here today that is struggling to let something go. This is the promise that Jesus says you says to Peter, truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children. There is no one who has left those things for the sake of the kingdom of God. Ready for those who have given their time, those that have given their talent, those that have given their treasures. There's no one who will not receive many times more in this time in the age to come. That is eternal life. You want it now, though, right? I want my Snickers now. 
I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. Give me what I deserve. Truly I say to you, no one who has left the house of his wife, the brother, the parent, or the children, for the sake of the kingdom of God, for what you do, it's not about what you do for yourself, it's what you're doing for Him. God says real clearly in the Word here, He says, no one who's done those things will not receive many times more over in the age to come. He made you a promise. Stop treating Jesus like He's a vending machine. The rich young ruler in Luke and Matthew and Mark serves as a warning to the people who want a Christian faith that does not change their values, that does not upset their lifestyle. He is a warning. You're going to walk up before the Lord and you're going to say, good teacher, what must I do to have eternal life? Jesus like, are you ready for this? Because you really don't view me for who I am. You really don't know how dirty you really are. And you really don't understand what I did on the cross. If so, why do you keep living the way you're living? Jesus does not command every seeking sinner to sell everything and give to the poor. That's where a lot of people want to carry that. Well, I've got to give everything I got. But he does know you. And he knows exactly where to place that finger of conviction in your life. And we as the church need to to, to listen to this word today. I needed to hear this word today. I hear sniffles. That means that God is working on some folks. Too much is at stake right now in our world to deceive ourselves, to think that we can manipulate Jesus and minimize his demands in order to preserve ourselves. It's way too important, church. I'm sorry if the message come along a little heavy this morning. Actually, I'm not. I love you. And God preached everything that God laid on my heart this week. Because I want to see us be able to store up those blessings. I want to see us as a church, as a family, come together with the correct view of who he is. He is God. He is a good God. He is Lord of Lords, maker of all things. He is everything that I've ever wanted, everything I've ever needed, everything I've ever desired. He fulfills that. I want us to come along together with that correct view of him. And then I want us to look at how how messy we are sometimes. It's okay to admit you're messy. I'm messy. I'm broken. I'm messed up. I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm, I'm sometimes, Darren says, I'm a little too open with what I struggle with. But I want us to come together as family so we could go through this thing because I, I, I want us to really understand what grace is and how beautiful it is. And the only way to can do that is if I look into my life and realize how dirty I am. I got to be honest with myself. And when I have my view, when we become our sins, we come together, then we can start to say, hey, let's start telling some people about Jesus. But let's 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 make it not about us and what we can get out of it. But, hey, I don't know. Maybe let's make it about what he can do for them. Because in closing, here's what we're basically saying. If we, if we don't do those things, we're really saying in closing, do you really want me? Jesus is asking this question to each of us. Do you really want me, church? Do you really want me, church? Or do you merely want the benefits I provide? Do you want me? Well, I want him. The lesson to learn is, is Jesus is not a vending machine. I mean, he is the sovereign savior. Why do we belittle him? We're flesh. And then the application is, and I want to finish with this one. The application is, whoo. Warning, tears are coming. The application is when I first come to this church, I sit right over there where my son Parker sits now. If you want to awkwardly stare at him right now. When I first come to this church and I was listening to this babbling preacher up here. He must have been on a deer hunt and come back. He was really excited. And he was like, blah, 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 blah. And I was just like, I don't even know what he's saying. And I'm being funny to keep the tears back for a second. The application is, this is what Brother Nate said one time. He said, we need to be praying to his face and not his hand. I never thought about that before. I'm always praying you know, God do this, God do that, God that, God that. God, you know, I'm always saying, God do, do. You know, I'm just praying those prayers. And it got to a point I was like, 
I don't pray to his face. I don't know if you've, if you've thought about that before or whatever. But, uh, you know, you know, uh, we, we come and I come in here, we come in here and we, 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 we get down to pray. I don't know if you've ever done that. And we, we get on those knees again, right? Hoping that that Snickers is going to fall. <laughs> and we're sitting there and we're praying and we're just, we're praying for him to do, praying to give, praying to receive. God, help me. God, do this. And I learned really quickly as he hit me with a sledgehammer that, that morning that I got to stop praying to his hands and I got to start praying to his face. I've got to stop treating him like something that can just give me something I want. And I, know, and I need to start living for someone that loves me. For someone that wants the best in me, in my life. I've got to stop praying to the hands and pray to the face. Pray with me.